The Transformer God Primus has answered my prayers. My boy Soundwave is going to open a huge can of you know what on Starscream in this video. What's up Beyonders, James here, and it's been a while, but we are finally back with Skybound's Transformers. So this opens up on Cybertron with Alita 1, leading a squad of Autobots consisting of Cup, Huffer, and Warpath, trying to reach this fortress while battling the Decepticons. When I initially read this issue, I told myself that fortress looks like Shockwave. It turns out it is Shockwave's fortress, but they don't explicitly say that in this issue. I had to look it up online in order to confirm this. Like I'm going to say here, and I have been saying throughout this entire series, Skybound's Transformers is partly inspired by Dreamwave's Transformers. Since Shockwave's Fortress first appeared in Dreamwave's Transformers, the War and Peace miniseries. Now, we're not given any indication of when this takes place in the issue. However, I think this is currently taking place because the war on Cybertron wouldn't end because the main forces and leaders of the Autobots and Decepticons are on Earth right now. Now, if this is in fact currently taking place, that's very interesting because the last time we saw Cybertron was in the fourth issue of Void Rivals, where we saw Shockwave seemingly running the show, and that's where we learned that he had barely enough Energon to sustain himself and his fellow Decepticons who he said were in stasis at that time. So are the Autobots here battling the Decepticons, or has Shockwave created robot sentries like in the G1 show? Anyways, Alita orders the team to charge for the fortress, and Cup has Huffer cover their rear with his shield. I was slightly confused by this because the only Autobot I know that can create a shield is Trailbreaker. Like I know Huffer is a construction engineer, but I don't remember him being able to construct a shield as one of his abilities. Huffer's shield though only has 7% power and it doesn't hold out long. The Decepticons easily penetrate it and boom, Huffer falls. The team makes it to the fortress and Warpath and Cup do their best to cover Alita 1, but Cup gets blasted in his midsection, separating his torso from the lower half of his body, and Warpath gets blown to bits. Cup yells to Alita, save him for all of us. And at that moment, he takes a shot to the head, and Cup is gone. Alita is the only one left. Now she makes her way into the fortress, and we see the Autobot they came to save is Ultra Magnus. However, Alita is horrified when she discovers they're too late. Shockwave has reduced him to nothing but a pile of parts, a shell of his former self. Alita says, what have they done to you? Now the reason why I say this is Ultra Magnus is because of something we'll learn later in the video. Now on Earth in the Pacific Ocean, the captain of the USS Henry Harrison receives a call from an admiral. After the call, the captain orders his men to head to the coast of Washington because they're going to find some giant robots. So this confirms for us that the government has become fully aware of the Transformers at least in some capacity. They aren't dismissing it as not a real thing like they did in the Duke miniseries. From here, we go to my absolute favorite part of the issue. Are you ready, Beyonders? Are you ready? At this volcanic region where the Decepticons are regrouping, Soundwave has called a meeting of the Decepticons. And when Starscream asks why, Soundwave answers, we find ourselves on the run, beaten by barely functioning Autobots and their weak humans. This is not the way it should be. We are the Decepticons, the conquerors, the ones who enslave. When Rumble tries to say Megatron would make this right, Starscream interrupts him by immediately throwing him into the ground and telling him to shut up. Soundwave says to Starscream, it's time to step down. Now Starscream tries to turn the other Decepticons against him, but that's not happening. His own Seeker brother Thundercracker steps up and says, he challenged you. This is our way. He pushes Starscream towards Soundwave while saying, ready yourself for combat. I love this so much because this shows us that the Decepticons live by a cartocracy, which is a form of government or rule where the strongest prove their strength and seize power. The strongest rules. Now we don't know yet how the Decepticons came to be in this universe. But should we find out that they were former gladiators who rebelled against the Autobot government, which is honestly my preferred origin for them, 
like in the Dreamwave and IDW universe. This philosophy and form of rule would perfectly go with that origin. Starscream quickly realizes he's in trouble and tries to ask Soundwave to wait, but Soundwave is like, nah son, and blasts one of Starscream's null rays. Starscream then tries to bargain with Soundwave, offering co-leadership. Soundwave responds, the time for talk is done. He straight up punches Starscream right in the face and gives Starscream a beating, completely destroying the damaged null ray on Starscream's body and sending his ass flying. Soundwave asks Starscream, do you yield? Starscream responds by yelling never and throws some rocks at Soundwave, temporarily distracting him and thinking he's got the drop on him. Oh man, how wrong he is. Soundwave grips his face in midair and slams him into the ground, tosses his own blaster so he can beat Starscream with his bare hands. Though Starscream fires his Null Ray and it damages Soundwave, it still doesn't stop him. Soundwave headbutts Starscream and ejects Laserbeak, who plunges his beak right into Starscream's optic and rips it out. Like holy hell. Despite enduring this almighty beating from Soundwave, Starscream is still so arrogant enough to believe he's in a position to bargain. He tells Soundwave he's willing to forgive this betrayal. Soundwave responds by walking towards him and says, you kicked my ravage. He plunges his fists into Starscream's chest, ripping out parts, and says the only path is extermination. Goodbye, Starscream. He drops his body over the cliff. Soundwave turns to his fellow Decepticons and says, These parts will help heal Ravage, but I will not only heal my own, we will rebuild, conquer, and destroy together. Are you with me, brothers? The Decepticons bow before Soundwave, and Thundercracker announces, Decepticons, honor our new leader. They all chant, Soundwave, Soundwave, Soundwave. God, do I love this image of my boy Soundwave as the new leader of the Decepticons. All hail Soundwave. From here, we transition to the Autobots. At the Ark, RC checks up on Carly, joining in on her rifle training. She impresses Carly with her shooting when she blows up her targets in one shot. She mentions that Optimus told her once she's the best shot he's ever seen. Though I'm still iffy, honestly, on Cliffjumper not taking the chance to eliminate Starscream at the end of the last arc in the last video, we learn here that RC shares his feelings toward the war. She is also tired of fighting this war and mentions to Carly she wishes she wasn't so good at shooting, wishes she didn't have to fight anymore. When Carly says she should be happy she's so skilled at it because it will help her eliminate Decepticons, like Starscream, RC responds, I can see the fire in your eyes. Be careful it doesn't consume you. She reveals to Carly that she reminds her of her younger self. She goes on to explain when she was very young, she had a teacher named Ultra Magnus who, when her clan was killed during the Siege of Cybertron, saved her. He was the one who taught her how to shoot and fight and everything she knows. This is another image I love in this issue. Ultra Magnus looks awesome. Now this is why I believe the bot Alita 1 and the Autobots were trying to save at the beginning of the issue is Ultra Magnus, because not only does the large size of the two match, and the armor has the same shade of blue, but also the fact that they're bringing him up in this issue. RC says to Carly, I wanted justice for my people. Magnus died because of my path of hate. A path that takes more than it heals Carly, if it heals at all. I love RC's advice and warning to Carly about the path of vengeance, because it's coming from someone who was on that path and it perfectly describes how, if you take that journey, it won't change anything at all at the end. If any of you are Naruto fans, this reminds me of Kakashi's let it go speech to Sasuke when he told him to let go of the drive of vengeance that was fueling him. Despite RC giving Carly that amazing response, that amazing advice, Carly just dismisses it. In the arc, Cliffjumper watches RC and Carly. He reveals to Jazz that he does feel guilty about not pulling the trigger on Starscream because Carly hasn't spoken to him ever since. Jazz tries to reassure him by telling him there's no shame in not pulling a trigger, especially during war. Meanwhile, Optimus and Ratchet are visiting Spike. 
At some point, Spike seems to have been told about his father's sacrifice and has been refusing to talk ever since then. Optimus tries to get him to talk, but Spike makes it clear he isn't mad at him or blame him for his father's death. He just needs more time. On their way back to the Ark, Ratchet reminds Optimus that Sparky's sacrifice was his choice, but Optimus still blames himself and wants to make it up to Spike in some way. Suddenly, Optimus sees a vision of himself holding a baby and becomes disoriented and drives himself off the road crashing into the forest. When Ratchet asks what happened, he answers he doesn't know. This is Optimus experiencing Sparky's memories. Now hear me out here, but what if Sparky is still alive? Because his soul has become one with the Matrix. There's an episode in the G1 cartoon called Autobot Spike, where Spike created a transformer he called Autobot X. When the Decepticons had attacked and Spike got injured and became comatose, the doctors needed Spike's mind to be transferred somewhere else so they could operate on his fragile body. Wheeljack and Sparkplug transferred Spike's mind into Autobot X's body. Now what if Sparky's soul gets somehow extracted from the Matrix and put into a Transformer? In the universe of the Transformers, you all know what I'm putting down isn't so far-fetched. Let me know what you all think in the comments below. They return to the Ark and Wheeljack informs all the Autobots he's having a hard time restoring the rest of the Autobots and repairing everyone, including himself, because he accidentally activated the remaining part of Skywarp's neural cortex. And since he's a part of Teletran 1, he is repeatedly locking him out of Teletran's repair systems. So he has been forced to repair everyone manually, which is taking forever. Optimus asks him to work as fast as he can because they finally have the upper hand on the Decepticons and need to end their reign of destruction on Earth. Wheeljack points out, in order to find the Decepticons, they need eyes in the sky. Optimus responds, I have a plan for that. He opens up a nearby room in the Ark where Jetfire's body lies and says, steal yourself Decepticons, we are coming for you. That's the end of the video. I hope you all enjoyed it. I will be coming out with the next one where things get even crazier as soon as I can. Other than that, have an awesome day. Make sure to hit that like button, subscribe, and always remember every day to transform and go beyond.